sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. And once again, welcome to the Back of the Range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg. This is episode 159. My guest on this episode is Buddy Alexander, former national championship winning coach at the University of Florida. Where do I start with all of his accomplishments? Well, not only was he an incredible coach, as I said, national championships, SEC coach of the year, conference championships, but he was quite the player as well. See, Buddy Alexander won the 1986 U.S. Amateur Championship, really one of the last mid-ams to win the Havemeyer Trophy. He played Walker Cup with Billy Andrade and Billy Mayfair, played the Eisenhower Trophy, and played in over 40 USGA events. We spoke about many fascinating topics. You know, his father played on tour and was a Ryder Cupper. We chatted about his experience playing in the Masters, paired with Jack Nicklaus in 1987. And we also spoke about his commandments that he gently communicated to his players at the University of Florida, really his philosophy on the game. And this is fantastic information for even the casual golfer. It will definitely help you enjoy your game a lot more. Special thanks to Nick Gillum, one of Coach Alexander's former players. He won the individual championship in 2001 when the University of Florida won the team championship. So Nick helped make this thing happen. He's a big supporter of the podcast and a former guest. So thank you to Nick. Don't forget, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram. You can find every single episode at thebackoftherange.com. There is more merch on the way. And again, there's more surprises as well. Let's get right into this episode. Coach Alexander, thanks so much for joining me at the back of the range. How are you? Well, thank you. I'm I'm quite well and uh, probably could use a little more time on the range, but uh, happy to be a part of the uh, the program tonight. See, I'm in a studio with a microphone in front of me and just kind of looking at notes and seeing where this conversation is going to go. But you just told me before we started recording that you are sitting on your back porch with a uh, a frosty adult beverage in your hand. Where does a um, you know a national championship coach? Where are you hanging your hat these days? Now that you're enjoying a, are, is this retirement golf you're playing? I don't think you're playing retirement golf. You're playing some serious competitive golf at some point. But what uh, what's your setup right now as far as where you're playing, what you're doing, uh, in in your in your game? Well, I live in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, we moved up here about <clears throat> four years ago. My my wife works for the university and. Um, I still dabble a little bit in a consulting business that I own. Mostly I mentor junior golfers and help them find the right college sure. uh, that they, that they want to uh, continue to play golf for. Um, I do some audits where I go to uh, various programs and uh, I meet with the coach for a day at the school. I can also do it uh, over the phone. Um, and just try to help them improve their program. Um, the, the, another thing I, I'd, I'd like to do more of is, is do some coaching searches, but athletic directors for some reason think they're smarter than, <laughs> than I am and they do, can do it by themselves. And, um, I have, I've done a couple of those and I really enjoy them and, and they're very inexpensive, but, um, those are the, the three primary things that I do in my little consulting business. But, for the most part, I am uh, certainly what I would call semi-retired. Um, I play, uh, I haven't played a whole lot of golf tournaments this year because there haven't been any to play in, yeah. but I've, I've played in the, in the U S uh, senior amateur every year that I've lived up here. Uh, I play in the Alabama golf association events, the senior am, uh, I've played in the four ball. I played in the mid am, um, my wife uh, ha has decided that we need to play in the mixed team championship oh, in boy. September. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, uh, you think you face pressure being, uh, you know, playing Walker cup and, and, and you haven't faced any pressure yet like this. I mean, you better get your game ready for this. Oh, that's far bigger than the Walker cup or U S open or anything. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. 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 Um, we, we play, we play, there's a Thursday night scramble, which we're not playing this week, but, we play in that together all the time. And she calls 
She calls those regular tour events. The mixed team state championship <laughs> a major. is a major. It's a major. That's a major. Right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right. So really, you're, you, I mean, you're looking to add to your resume. I mean, the other stuff, I mean, there's, there's just stuff on here that, you know, Eisenhower trophy and that, that's just, but that's going to be low on the list. If you can, you know, snag a mixed, uh, a mixed championship. Well, I don't, yeah. I mean, she's a legit, uh, 15 handicapper. She's not too bad. And, uh, uh, I don't know what the, uh, I don't know exactly what the format is. I think it's, I think it's a, a modified, uh, alternate shots where you take the best drive and then play in from there. We, we actually won the, uh, Saga Hatchie mixed club championship, uh, two years in a row. So, uh, we've got some experience and, you know, so far I haven't been kicked out of the house, so I'm doing all right. <laughs> I, I, this is a, this is a unique one. Well, you definitely have the pedigree for, for obviously on the golf course. And I think that's fascinating with your, uh, consulting and trying to shape junior golf and then also trying to shape programs. And uh, you've won a few uh, Coach of the Year awards in the SEC in your day, and uh, whether it be at LSU or, or at the University of Florida, um, you know, uh, we can't get into every single one of your accomplishments, but for listeners that may not be familiar, you had a, a great amateur career. And then once you got into coaching, uh, you know, two national championships at the University of Florida and uh, you know, uh, guided several players from the collegiate ranks to the PGA Tour. But as I always like to do when I have these conversations with, with great guests like yourself, uh, I like going back to the beginning a little bit of how you got into the game and maybe learn a little bit more about how you got shaped uh, to become a, a great player and also a coach. So tell me a little bit about uh, when you started playing. What was your introduction to the game of golf? Well, my father played the tour and – um he made a couple of Ryder cup teams and he won uh, several tour events. And in 1950, before I was born, uh, he was in an airplane accident in which he was the uh, only survivor. It was a smaller plane with, with four people on there. Uh, but, uh, you know, essentially he went to, um, he was in the hospital for about seven months, very lucky to live. He, he later won the Hogan award. Um, you know, which is the, the golf award for people who have come overcome, uh, injury and, uh, or illness or what have you. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and, um, so he was unable to play professionally after that accident. Uh, and that was in, that was in 1950. He was only 31, um, and well on his way to being a, a really terrific player. And not that he wasn't a terrific player, but, you know, I mean, he was in the peak of his, of his career, but um, he took a job as the golf professional at Lakewood Country Club in St. Petersburg, which is now called St. Petersburg Country Club. Um, and I grew up on the eighth tee. And, um, you know, we, I'd get on my bicycle and I could ride down to the golf course and play and practice as much as I wanted. Um, you know, he put me to work cleaning clubs and shagging balls. And uh, there was a baseball field behind the club and a, and a, uh, that's where my football practice was, you know, it was a, it was a city park that was right behind the, the clubhouse. Right. So we played baseball and we played basketball and we played football and we played golf and we rode our bikes forever and ever. And my dog followed me around and, um, I did a little bit of everything until, oh, I guess my junior year of high school, I started to get a little bit more serious about golf. Um, and I played okay on the on the state level. I won the city tournament three years in a row, and and uh, and I was sort of re I was recruited a little bit by Florida and Florida State, but nothing to be you know nothing nothing crazy. Um, and I ended up going to Georgia Southern, yeah. and uh, I like the small school atmosphere. I like the coach. Uh, I like the golf course that we got to play all the time. It was a nice little club. Forest Heights Country Club in Statesboro, Georgia. And it was, um, I don't know, it was just really different from growing up in St. Pete. And I was interested in that. And I went there and, and got better and better and, and um, ended up making the All-America team, um, uh, second and third team, I think, my last couple of years. And then um, I, uh, one, I was kind of waiting for the, 
77 Walker Cup team. And so I got a job at Hilton Head. I lived in Hilton Head for a year as a just a, a cart boy. Um, that was a fun time. You know, I was making about, I don't know, I was probably making a hundred dollars a week in my in my salary um and i was probably making about fifty dollars in tips and uh i was making about fifty dollars a week gambling because uh, all the pros on the island thought they could play pretty good and they really weren't that good <laughs> okay. um and so uh you know i had a little change in my pocket and not a whole lot of responsibility um and we had uh we had been pretty good at georgia southern we went to the ncaa tournament uh, well, eventually we ended up going to the NCAA tournament finals 11 years in a row. And, um, I was a part of a lot of those. Um, but we were, we were really good my, uh, junior and senior year. And, uh, the year after I left, they were pretty good. And as a result, uh, Jesse had it, the old golf coach from Wake Forest, yeah. um, went to, Oral Roberts, he got a big contract to go out to Oral Roberts. And uh, my coach got the job at Wake Forest. And this was late in the summer. And I had always told him that if I didn't play the tour, that I wanted to coach golf because I knew I didn't want to be a club pro. Okay. And he called me up and he said, hey, they need a coach for this coming fall. And, you know, if you'll go to graduate school, um, you know, you can, they'll, they'll give you a graduate assistance position and you can be the interim coach. And that's how I got into coaching. Um, so I did that for a year. We got to the NCAA finals. Um, and it was, it was a pretty good gig. And, um, but I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to do it for graduate assistant money again. Right, and, right. and so they made me the only full-time faculty member that didn't have a master's degree. And the agreement was I had to continue to work toward my master's degree, which I did and um, ended up staying for four years before I turned pro and tried to play professionally at age 27. Nice. Nice. Um, and I had some success on the mini tours and, you know, there was no corn fairy tour back then. Um, there was no Latin American tour. There was no, Canadian tour you just you were either on the tour or you were a mini tour guy right. and um you know we had a lot of really good mini tour players Russ Cochran and Paul Azinger and Joey Sindelar and uh Dick Mast uh, was was one that I recall was really good um just you know Larry Rinker I mean I could go on and on sure Bob, Bob Tway played down there a little bit um there were a whole bunch of guys that played down there when I played and, um, but I just wasn't quite good enough. So after a couple of years, I decided that, you know, the coaching thing was something that was appealing to me. And, uh, I applied for the job in the summer of 82 at, um, at LSU and they hired me and, uh, I was there for five years and then, uh, for a brief six months, I was in Cleveland, Ohio as a sports management with, uh, IMG, which was the largest sports management company in the world at the time. And, um, I was a little chilly in Cleveland for a Florida boy. Sure. Uh, and the Florida job became available and I applied for that and I was there for 27 years. Before we, yeah, and I and I appreciate you laying out just kind of the scope and the trajectory of, of you know when you started playing and then ultimately to when you uh, ended up at Florida as the coach. Um, I got to be honest with you, and, and this is kind of a little transparency for the listeners. There are you know things that I know about your um, upbringing and your um, you know your trajectory that I know these stories, but maybe the listeners don't know the stories. So if if you would entertain us could you please tell the story of how your father was able to play Ryder cup after he was in his accident yeah he the uh, the accident was in september and um somewhere i mean they ended up he had like a, a 22 surgeries of some sort or another and his um you know his they had a lot they did a lot of skin grafting off of his off of his butt um, in fact, we used to call him Madras butt because he looked like a pair of the, those old Madras pants that had, you know, the patches on them. Um, I should say he used to call himself Madras. Okay. Butt, you know? Yeah. That's kind of a hard uh, nickname for someone else to give you. You got to kind of own that yourself. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, he used to refer to the accident as before years or after years because the, the fringes of his ears were burned so badly that he, he basically he barely had enough ear to hang his glasses on. Oh, wow. But, um, you know, one of the surgeries, they got, they got to a point where they were going to amputate his, his ring and his little fingers uh, on both hands. And, you know, he said, like, you know, if you do that, I'll never play golf again. And he talked to the doctor and he, he talked him into uh, freezing uh, the, the last knuckle and the second to last knuckle on the little fingers and the last knuckle on the ring fingers so that they were permanently, uh, you know, bent or half closed, but he could still clamp down on a club. And that's, that's what they did. And then, um, you know, in April, they allowed him to, he would have been you know, invited to the masters. Uh, they let him sit between the 12th fairway, the 12th green and the 13th tee. So all the players could come by and say hello to him, you know, on their way between the two. Wow. And by, by June, he was playing, um, you know, he started to play a little golf again. The Ryder Cup matches were in late September and they were at Pinehurst, which were, which was his favorite course in the world. Cause he, he grew up in, in North Carolina and he actually won the, uh, North South and yeah. 41, but, um, he, uh, he started practicing and he needed to go out and make a couple of cuts or play in a couple of tournaments to get a couple more. Ryder Cup points, which he did, and because basically he made the team on what he had done in in fifty alone. He was, right. I think he was, I think he was third lead money winner in nineteen fifty at the time of the accident. Um, he was fifth lead money winner in forty eight, and seventeenth money winner in forty nine. He, he he blames that on his on on my mom because that's when they got married. Okay. But, uh, Anyway, he earned a couple points and uh, made the team and got to play in the Ryder Cup matches in September of 51. Wow. Incredible. That's uh, very, very deserving of that, uh, that Hogan comeback uh, award. That's, uh, that's incredible. Um, well, thank you for sharing that one because I wanted to make sure that we, we fit that in because I just think that's a great story. You, um, so so you, you ran me through basically your, your coaching start. Um, and and you continued to play while you were coaching, and and obviously the the crowning achievement I would imagine of your playing career is winning the 1986 U.S. Amateur Championship. And this is you're around the age of I guess what about 32, 33 years old. You're still at LSU, and actually that was a great year you had. You guys won the SEC that year. Yeah, that was a good year. Um, I was 33, and um, you know after you after you played professional golf and hoped to play the tour and that was your dream. Um, you know, I didn't really have a desire to play a lot of golf. I jumped into the, into the coaching thing in 82 and, and 83, uh, you know, kind of uh, head first. And I, I probably played 10 rounds of golf that year. Um, but when the kids went home after the NCAA tournament, I'm sitting around there and I don't have anything to do. So I started playing a little bit and they had to, they had a, a, a Louisiana Open, which was a, a closed open. You had to be a resident of the state. And they had a pretty decent um, purse, you know, like, you know, I, I think it was like 10000 for first and 5000 for second. And I was making $25,000 a year coaching men and women. And um, I entered the, the Louisiana Open and started practicing in earnest a little bit. and. Sure. Um, and it was fun. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, I, I, I think I finished third and, you know, won, won a couple thousand dollars, but you know, uh, it was, it was fun. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, golf wasn't fun. You know, when you're getting beat up trying yeah. to play professional golf toward the end and you realize that your dream's not going to come true, it's not really a whole lot of fun. That's my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, we have like, a little interference here from a tree, a tree and walker coonhound who can make a lot of noise. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, you're fine. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I, uh, I played pretty good and I, I enjoyed it. And so I looked into getting into the PGA and there was no way to do it um, as a golf coach back then. You now can be a pro and accumulate uh, points toward your PGA 
uh, uh, apprenticeship and ultimately your, your your membership. But um, I didn't I, I didn't have that opportunity back then. And I'd always loved amateur golf. And I thought, well, you know, hey, I get my amateur status back and, you know, maybe I'll play in some member guests or, yeah. you know, just whatever. But there's no sense in being a pro if I can't make any money at it. And um, so I got my amateur status back and uh, they, they whammed me for three years back then. It was that was the that was the longest uh, probationary period. Um, and it was based on how much money you won and how many tour events you want you played in and right. i go like well damn i didn't win a whole lot of money <laughs> and i and i didn't play in a whole lot of tour events i played about four or five of them but i you know and i snuck in on a monday qualifier but sure I, anyway they gave me the, the the whole enchilada of three years and um so i got my amateur status back um my last professional violation if you will would have been that louisiana open in the summer of 83 and so I got my, uh, I got my amateur status back in June of the end of June, uh, 86. And then I won the U S amateur in, uh, at the end of August and on the same summer. Yeah. Picked it up at Shoal Creek. What now we were, I, I was just looking at the past U S amateur champions and it's, it's you in 86. And then I believe it's, it's Mitch Fogus in 91 john harris in 93 and that's basically the end of mid-ams you know guys that are you know about 25 30 years old and up that's pretty much the end of of mid-ams winning the usam you know 94 started tigers three-peat and then they're off to the races with a lot of college kids i mean sitting back and thinking about it did it seem like such an unlikely thing or or you were out of your element around all these college kids when you were playing because i would imagine for for guys that are in their mid thirties now at a U.S. amateur, you know, this year is going to be different. Since there's no qualifying, you know, there's a handful of, uh, you know, mid amateurs that are going to be there. Basically, you know, maybe it's based on their, on their, on their wagger, but for the most part, it's based on what they've done in U.S. mid ams in the last, you know, one, two or three years. But looking back on it, did it seem like such an, you know, anomaly for a, for a 32, 33 year old to be contest or contending for a U.S. amateur? No, not at all. Um, back then, there were a lot of, of really good mid amateur players. Um, you know, Bob Lewis and uh, Bill Leffler and Jay Siegel were and I were the four were the four mid amateurs. You know, now they they made a rule for a while where you had to have at least two. Now I think they have to have at least one. I mean, we had four guys that were going to the Northeast Amateur and the U.S. Amateur. I mean, Jay Siegel won the, the U.S. Amateur in you know, like 82 and 83 back to back. Yep. Um, and there were guys like Jerry Corville and uh, Buddy Marucci. And I mean, the list is 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 lengthy. How many guys that we had that were very, very competitive when we went to play in the Porter Cup and the Sunny Hannah and the Northeast and um, the Western Amateur and so on and so forth. And there's a good reason for it. Uh, and, and the, and the reason is, is equipment. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to get on my soapbox about how far guys are hitting it. I'm going to take a little different route in, in, in the eighties as tour players, you basically peaked in, in, and really didn't even get really good at it until you were in your thirties. Unless, unless your name was, was Crenshaw or, I'm not, I'm not going to say that the beans and the Cokes and the, uh, of the world weren't pretty good in their, in their twenties, but they were probably at their best in their early thirties. Right. And you, you know, first of all, you're playing with a, a ballad of spinny ball. You're, you're playing with, without square grooves. So you have grooves that are V shaped and it took a long time to learn how not to hit flyers or, or how to control flyers or know when they were coming. Right. Uh, you know, when the square groove came along, the younger, more inexperienced players, all of a sudden didn't, didn't have to worry about those things. Um, and uh, you were playing with wooden clubs that had bulge and roll. And when you hit the ball on the toe, it was either, it, it would either be a snap hook or it would go so far into right field. You couldn't find it. Right. Um, if you hit it in the heel, it might go between your legs. 
uh, you know, and and if you if you hit it on the on the top, it 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 just jumps straight up in the air and it go about 185 yards. Uh, if you hit it on the bottom, it would carry about 100 yards and you know it wouldn't go anywhere. So the the bottom line is, it took a little longer to become a a really good player and play the tour in the in the 80s and the 70s, even before that. Um, and so uh, consequently, you had a lot of a lot of mid am guys in their 30s, uh, even in their 40s. Uh, I, I mean, you know, Bob Lewis lost in the finals of the U.S. Amateur to Hal Sutton. So uh, and that was, I think, in 1980 or something. And and then, like I said, Jay Sigel won twice in the 80s. And so when I came along and won in 86, it was it was no shocker. Right. Um and, and I don't think I'd ever, and I, I'm, I'm willing to admit this. I don't think I would have ever won the U S amateur if I had not played professional golf. You know, I, 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 I gigged the USGA a little bit about giving me three years back then, but in reality, uh, you know, I learned so much and became so much of a better player uh, because of the experiences that I had as a, a professional golfer that I never would have won the U S am without it. And, and I was the first, um, reinstated amateur to ever win the u.s amateur yeah uh, and then like you said mitch voges came along shortly thereafter in 91 and john harris in 93 and then that's been the end of it and you know as as i said earlier you know they're they're searching for and dying to have uh one or two mid amateurs on the team uh whereas you know back in the 80s it was it was common very common for a Walker cup team to have, uh, you know, four, four mid amateurs on the team. And they, and they got on there without any question at all about whether or not they were deserving or not. They, they are in their way on there. And it was, it was an easy pick for the, for the selection committee, in my opinion, in most cases. Yeah. So do you think, and, and you probably have already answered this, but do you think that now the reason we're not seeing more mid ams at a U.S. amateur, is it, is it just because the college kids are playing so much more and have so many more tournaments and time to play? Or is it that the quality of the mid ams is just where it's just not at the level it was in, in the, in the mid eighties. I mean, have you thought maybe how to potentially explain why there's not more mid ams in, in that are contesting year after year in, in, or, I mean, they're contesting, but they're not, they haven't popped over and, and picked up a victory. I think it's a little bit of everything. Okay. I think, I, I think the, uh, you know, it, like I said, I think equipment has continued to make the, the game easier for younger players. Right. Um, I think that the uh, AJGA has done a great job of providing an opportunity for juniors to play a lot of uh, uh, events before they go to college. And then after the AJGA, you've got, Southeastern junior golf tour and many other, uh, junior tours. Uh, the Florida state golf association has their own Florida junior tour. Um, they you know, they, you got opportunities to compete and play. Uh, it, you couple that with the fact that, uh, technology has made it a little bit easier. And now kids are realizing that, Hey, I can get bigger and stronger and longer by going to the gym and businessmen, don't have the time to do that. So they can't, they, they, they don't, they might outsmart them a little bit, but sure. they're not going to, they're not going to make up the difference between the athleticism that our good young college players have and their strength that they have. And the, you know, the opportunity that they had when they were, you know, junior golfers, um, you know, you go to, you, you go to a, a golf program now, the coaches are way better. I mean, you know, I was one of the first coaches that, that, you know, even had a a real live playing resume. Um, and so, um, you know, we used to refer to a lot of guys as just a bunch of old bus drivers. drivers. I knew exactly where you were going with that. And, 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 you know, now you go, if you come to Auburn uh, uh, and, and you play for Nick Kleiner, you play for a guy that played college golf at a high, high level and, um, played professional golf and he knows what he's talking about. And same with JC Deacon at Florida and same with, you know, almost every program now has a, 
a, a real live golf coach, you know, as opposed to somebody that, you know, they just pulled out of the athletic department to uh, drive the van and hand out the, the titleists. Yeah, I was, you know, just like you were saying, I was thinking about asking you basically how much of an advantage you had by, by being a, being a player, you're, you're, you're a coach, but obviously you can go out with your players and, and you can, you know, go toe to toe with them, you know, take, you know, beat them in practice sessions. And I'm guessing that that just gets so much more respect and you, you, you demand their respect when you're able to beat them on the golf course. Well, yeah, I mean, when, you know, you talk about eight eighty six, uh, that winter, uh, when the kids came back from, from, uh, Christmas break, I played in every qualifying round with David Toms and Rob McNamara, who was player of the year in the SEC that year and Emlyn Aubrey and Bob friend and, you know, all these guys that were on my team who could, who, you know, and Emlyn and Bob ultimately played the tour uh, themselves a little bit. And I'm playing qualifying rounds with them and I'm playing, you know, I'm, I'm as good as they are. I mean, I know I'm as good as they are and, and, and I'm older than they are. So when I have some advice and, and I want to try to get a point across to them, uh, they're, they're certainly going to be a whole lot more apt to listen to that than they are their 10 handicapped father right. or, <laughs> or, or a coach that <laughs> might not even be a 10 handicap. There, there you go. There you go. Well, I want to ask you a couple of coaching questions, but I can't skip over two of the perks of being a U.S. amateur champion. Uh, one of them, obviously, we've we've kind of uh, talked around is the fact that you're on the '87 Walker Cup team that goes over to Sunningdale and just lays uh, lays the wood, so to speak, to to the GB&I team. Uh, your your victory, gosh, I think it's sixteen, yeah, sixteen and a half to seven and a half over at Sunningdale. I mean, this thing was over after the first day, practically. But you, know, you had some kids on that team. You had, you had Andre, you had Chris Kite, who you beat in the final at the USAM, and you had Lenny Matisse. But you had some, like you were saying earlier, you had some men on that team. That wasn't just a you know college showcase exhibition. You had some, you had some men. You had Sigel, you had Lewis, you had Loeffler. Um, how was the dynamic between, between the older crew and the younger crew, so to speak, on the U.S. team? Oh, it was great. It, there, there were no, uh, you know, there were, there were no issues at all. I mean, we – we all got along, and in fact, the the World Cup team, the Eisenhower Cup team, yeah. in in the fall of of '86, had three mid ams, and it was it was Siegel, Lewis, myself, and Billy Andre, and Billy was great. You know, he was like having a little a little kid <laughs> along with us. Get the, and, get, um, get the luggage, Billy. Go ahead. You're yeah, great. yeah. And Bill Campbell was our captain, and. Uh, we didn't win. We lost by a couple shots to Canada. Uh, they played great, and we, we played we played pretty good. I played okay there as well. Um, but Billy and I went to Augusta to play a couple practice rounds in November after school was out, and uh, or maybe during Thanksgiving or 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 something. But you know, and, and I love Billy, and I and I wanted I wanted to play with Billy, and and I the captain of our Walker Cup team was Fred Ridley. Yep. And, you know, Fred and I have known each other since we were about 12 years old playing junior golf in Florida. And um, I told him, I said, man, I'd, I'd love to play with Billy, man. We just went to Augusta. We had a great time. And and, and Fred leaned on me a little bit, uh, asking me about different guys on the team because, obviously, I knew the college players. Sure. Um, and we get, to, uh, we get to Sunningdale, and um, I had told him earlier – that the best player on the team was Billy Mayfair and Billy, uh, had not yet won the U S amateur in 87, right. uh, down at Jupiter Hills, Hills, but he was on that team. And I told, I told Fred, I go, Fred, the best player on the team is Billy Mayfair. And, you know, Billy Andre's a pretty close second. And then you got us old guys and, <laughs> and, and the rest of the guys are good players too. And so on and so forth. And, and he said, uh, okay. And so we get to Sunnydale and we're getting ready to play our first, our first practice round, which was always alternate shots because we didn't ever play alternate shots. Right. Right. And so we had to pra practice a little alternate shots. And, uh, first, first day he goes, okay, I got Alexander and Mayfair playing against Sigel and, um, Andre. I go like, all right, well, he didn't give me the guy I wanted, <laughs> but he gave me the best player on the team. I'll take it. Okay. And, uh, 
you know, Billy went to Wake Forest. Jay Sigel went to Wake Forest. So we went out there and we played and we had a good match. I don't, I, I don't even know if, who won, but it was one up or one, or even or something, you know. So the next day he switched and I had Billy Andre as a partner and, and Sigel had Mayfair and it did, it just didn't work. You know, like Billy right. was in my bag all day long trying to tell me how to play shots. And, oh, and I'm just like, okay. man, I don't want that. And I love Billy and I kid him about it now. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, uh, we, we got hammered. And so we ended up, obviously I played with Mayfair and that was the right call. Fred made a great call there and, and did a great job all week. But, but, the, you know, you know, when you, first of all, I'm 30, I'm 34 years old at that time. Now, Jay, you know, Jay was very laid back and a little bit older. And Lewis w- was even older than Jay, maybe. I don't know. But, and, and, you know, Louis was really hyper and, you know, he was running around all the time, you know, just getting into everything. And, uh, the, but, the, the, and, and Le- Leffler was a great guy too. And I had known Leffler. He played at Arizona State. I had known him for a long time. He, he won the Mid Am, you know, that year. And, um, it was just, it was great. We, we had a good time and the, the young guys would ask, you know, Siegel and Lewis, most of the questions, cause they had played on previous Walker cup teams right. and World Cup teams. And, um, but it was, you know, we were ready to rock and roll. Fred did a great job. Um, actually Billy and I played Colin Montgomery and Graham Shaw in yeah. the first match. Yes, you did. And, and, um, we, we hammered them pretty good. Um, we got there and, um, the, the, you know, we're trying to figure out who should go off the odd numbered holes and who should go off the even numbered holes. <laughs> and the caddy goes, well, typically the strong, cause they play those, that game all the time over there. And they go like, typically the stronger player should probably play off the odd numbered holes. And, and I go like, okay, that's you, Billy. Good. You're on the odd <laughs> hole. And so we got to the first tee. We're going to hit the first shot in the Walker cup matches. And Billy's got the tee and, you know, we're standing there nervous as hell about to play. And he walks over and he goes, now I know why you wanted me to play the odd number. There hole. you go. Yeah. Because uh, he, he had to go first. It is so funny because I've spoken to, I think, oh gosh, at least over two dozen Walker Cuppers. And whenever this part of, uh, whenever this comes up in conversation, it's hysterical because you guys are the 10 best amateurs in the country. You are chosen to represent the country and it literally comes down to that tee box. Everyone's like, I'm not it. You're it. I'm not hitting it. You, oh, no, no, you do it. Oh, you, it's hysterical. <laughs> it's like, guys are the world beaters, the U.S. amateur champions, mid-am champs, and you turn into, into like, seventh graders. They're like, I'm not, I'm not going to ask her to dance. You ask her. I'm not talking to her. Oh, yeah. That's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> what it's like. You're, yeah, but you know what? If you talk to Ryder Cup players, oh, the same you're, thing. you're a hundred percent right. It could be the exact same thing for Ryder Cup, Presidents Cup, anything. It's just, it's just funny that at that level, it still exists. It's still reminiscent of the the weekend hacker that has to hit a shot in front of his buddies on a Saturday right. morning. It's great. That's what's so great about it. So you mentioned Fred Ridley. Um, you know what he does right now, right? He's got a job at that club in Georgia, right? Who? Fred Ridley. Who? Uh, this Ridley. Uh, he, he, yeah, I, yeah. He's in charge of yeah, tic- he's in charge of tickets at Augusta National, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's Some, in charge of a whole lot more than tickets. Okay, mer- yeah, merchandising absolutely. or something. I don't know. He makes he makes the uh, he makes the pimento cheese. He does something. Anyway, <laughs> what I'm getting at is because of your U.S. Amateur win, um, I, you know, I'm not sure how many people know about the fact that U.S. Amateur champions for a very long time. I think it ended maybe ten years ago, somewhere in that. Horde Harden range, I believe, is when it ended, when he was the chairman. But U.S. Amateur champions were able to return to the Masters every year to play in the Par 3 contest. When did you first learn, or did you know about that before you won the U.S. Am, or was that something that someone tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, by the way, here's another little perk you get? Oh, I have no idea when I learned of it. I don't think I knew about it uh, when I won the U.S. Amateur. I, when I went to play in the two uh, yeah. master, Masters, I'm sure I ran into uh, Vinnie Giles and others, um, and I'm, I'm sure I learned of it then. But, um, you know, it, it was it, it's an honor to go back. <clears throat> um, I, I usually go over there on 
Sunday night, I stay with one of my best friends in the world, Trip Kulke, who played for me at Georgia Southern. Um, I go in and I get my credentials on Monday morning. And then uh, Monday night is the amateur dinner. Right. So I go, to, I go to the amateur dinner on Monday night. Um, and, and usually we, we stay until, you know, Thursday afternoon and then drive home and watch it on TV because sure. you can see a whole, a whole lot more. Of course. But, but um, the answer to your question is, is yes. We used to uh, be able to play the practice rounds on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And also the par three tournament. And they just stopped that about five years ago. Okay. Uh, so in my younger days, hell yeah, I'm going to play the practice round. <laughs> I mean, if you get to play Augusta National, you, you play there anytime you can. And um, I would play with former players typically, or, uh, you know, just people that, that I knew pretty well. Uh, Jerry Pate, he used to, yeah. I used to play with Jerry all the time. Uh, we, you know, we're the exact same age. We played college golf at the same time. And, um, we, I, I played with Dudley Hart and Chris DeMarco and Camila Bajegas. And, but, you know, after, after they lengthened the course and, you know, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the yard and pound a year club. I lose a yard and gain a pound every year. Okay. Uh, so, you know, about 10 years ago. I quit playing in the practice rounds just because like, man, I don't, I don't need to be out here. Right. I get it, you know, 25 or 30 yards short of these guys. And, uh, I don't have that big an ego. So, but, but I, but I played in the part three tournament every year until, uh, they told us that we could not. And, and I am totally cool with what happened. I, I get it completely. It's, it's entertainment. Um, uh, you got a lot of kids that are hitting balls now, uh, it takes a long time to play. They didn't want it to get to a point where I think the pros didn't want to play because it took so long. Um, and, you know, it, it made sense. I feel badly for the younger guys. Um, by the way, it's not just amateurs. It's also professionals like Ian Baker Finch right. and Andy yeah. North and Jerry Pate, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, Curtis Strange. Anybody that's won a major championship, gets to come back as an honorary invitee. And for the younger guys uh, who didn't get to play in the par three tournament for 30 years in a row, I feel, I feel kind of bad, but for me personally, I totally get it. I'm, I'm fine with it. And, you know, I, you know, I just am so thankful that I had the opportunities that I did have along the way. I'm, I'm sure that there are several memories to pull on and I'm, I, it's kind of an unfair question, but, I mean, you're basically for several years doing a two to three day <laughs> golf vacation at, at Augusta national Were there ever, yeah. is there, I mean, that's, that's insane. I, I, that's, that's gotta be the coolest thing, but um, can you maybe think of a round or a story with someone you played with just as like, can you believe I get to do this? And we're, we're here at Augusta and, and playing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in front of the, the fans that are here for the practice round or maybe one of your favorite games that you played. I'm sure there's got to be a there's got to be w at least one story in there somewhere. Well, there's I mean, you know, I don't I don't know specifically on the big course. I can remember playing a practice round with uh Mark Kakovecchia and and Ken Green and I think it was Gary Coke, so it was all Gators and um you know, Green and Kalk were best friends and they would gamble on anything. And they would I mean, they would hit shots and they would, you know, pay hey, $20. I can hit this shot within so-and-so or whatever. And, and they're, they're literally call it crawling up on the little short TV stands to the right of the 13th green and chipping the ball off of the TV stand over the Creek onto the green. And, <laughs> okay. you know, it, it, was, it was just hilarious. And, and then of course, you know, I don't know who started it, but um, you know, somewhere in there, we started skipping the ball across the pond on 16 right. to, to get it to go up on the green. And, I'm sure I had, uh, you know, 30 or 40 tries at that. And I, I do remember one time getting one to skip across there about two or three times and, and, and kicking up on the green. But um, I got a couple of pretty good par three stories in that in 87, when I was playing in the tournament, uh, I'm playing with Mike Donald, who played for me at, at Georgia Southern, one of my best friends again in the world today. 
and a guy that he was really close to at the time, Fred Couples. So we're playing a threesome, and and Azinger and uh, Green and Kalkovecki have come up behind us, and they go like, "All right, well let's let's play for twenty dollars a hole." I go like, and and I'm I'm going, you know, I ain't making a whole lot of money, so twenty dollars a hole is a lot. That's a big that's a big bet for me, you know. Sure. It's chump change for these guys. So on number one, I hit it for, I hit it about a foot from the hole and it was close to the hole at the time. And, you know, you get crystal for close to the hole. And on number two, I hit it about, uh, I hit it about six inches from the hole. So I start out birdie birdie for my $20 a hole. And uh, before I hit my tee shot, uh, Steve Elkington made a one on number one. And Azinger made a one on number two. So not only do I not get any crystal on the $20 a hole thing, I'm already one down, you know, and I've okay. gone two, two. Uh-huh. So, so uh, that was one story that I remember. And then toward the end, one of the last years I played in the part three tournament with my son caddying and playing with Billy Horschel and Matt Every, uh, I made a hole in one on number two, which was pretty cool. There you go. And you get, and you got the, you got that crystal. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I got, I got crystal for close to the hole on number seven, one year, uh, you know, several, several years ago. I don't remember what year it was, but <laughs> nice. snuck one in there kind of close. Going back to your, your time at the university of Florida, uh, you know, two national championships. I've spoken to a lot of Gators and, uh, I've spoken to some of your former players, did a little bit of research, got a, got a, you know, thanks to Nick Gillum for putting us together. He, uh, Obviously, part of that uh, 2001 championship season where he picked up the individual NCAA title, and uh, you know, spoken to Duke Butler and and Josh McCumber and a couple other guys, and I've been told that there are uh, there are some commandments that uh, you have have communicated to your to your team uh, teammates or team members, I should say, over the years at the University of Florida, and um, I'm wondering if these commandments would apply to listeners in their casual game or are these just commandments that you had for being on the team can you explain a little bit about these these commandments of golf that you have the funniest part about the commandments was that every time a, a freshman would come in he would go like you know coach you've got 12 commandments and god only had 10 you know what's <laughs> up with that and i would i would just go like well you know golf can be a little more complicated than life so you know that's why we might have to have 12 excellent good well said the um, the commandments started in at the NCAA tournament in New Mexico, which would have been ninety seven, I think. And um, Brian Craig was the uh, my assistant coach. He's now the coach at Kentucky. And I I'm just sitting there, and I'm 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 just thinking to myself, how many times am I going to have to, to repeat the same thing over and over and over to guys about, you know, certain way to play shots and certain things to do. Like, you know, if you're, if you're putting up a level on a putting green and it's a pretty significant uh, shelf or plateau, 90% of the time, even a tour player will leave the ball short, of except course. maybe at Augusta, at least, at, except maybe at Augusta national uh, where the greens are a little faster, but, I just, so I just started to write things down that I was telling them over and over again. Some of them, you know, I stole from Rotella about, um, you know, conservative aim, cocky swing, um, you know, little, just, just tidbits of golf about, you know, certain things that, that you know, there, there were tips, they were helpful. They were things that helped them understand a certain situation a little bit better or be a little bit better player. And, you know, like I said, some of them were, uh, uh, sports psych type stuff. Some of them were about, you know, have the flag stick attended outside of 30 feet because your overall depth perception is way better. If there's a person standing next to the hole, as opposed to taking the flag stick out and just butting at a four and a quarter inch hole in the ground. Um, then that was something that I learned from my dad. I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't something that, you know, I came up with, it was, it was something that had been passed down. So I just started to put all these things together and it happened to come out to about 12 of them. And so I put them on these little cards and I made them 
memorize them at the beginning of every year. And uh, then I would quiz them on them uh, uh, on, on occasion. <laughs> and um, it is, I mean, like if you go up to Billy Horschel at the next tour event that you see him and you ask him what first things first means, he will explain it to you. And it will make a lot of sense to you from a golf standpoint. Uh, he will, he will remember that. And, you know, it's funny that, that, that guys on tour now are leaving the flag stick in from outside of 30 feet a lot. Now, uh, I still get some really crazy looks when I play tournament golf and I've got a 50 footer and I go like, Hey, would you attend the flag stick? And don't forget, you still have to take it out right? because, you know, some people might've forgotten what the rule is, but it, your depth perception is going to be better if there's somebody standing next to the hole. Um, and, and yet tour players where before they just automatically yank the flag stick out. A lot of them are leaving the flag stick in when they're outside of 30 feet now. And, um, uh, you know, they might not have realized why, but, uh, the depth perception thing is, is a good part of that. So the 12 commandments are just an accumulation of golf knowledge put in a, a commandment, uh, mode so that they could remember them. And I wouldn't always have to remind them after they made the same mistake over and over and over. I just refer to the, hey, dude, number 12 today. That was commandment number six. You messed it up. <laughs> Who, if, I, I, I hate to ask you to throw a player under the bus, but they, they're, they, they're probably doing pretty well if, they're, if you're going to mention their name. But can you think back of a player that was just – so good, but still just could not get the commandments right and still would make the same bonehead mistakes over and over again, but he still was so great. I mean, probably had a lot of players like that, I'm guessing. Uh, no, no, the commandments were pretty simple. Okay. And I'm not going to say that they that they didn't, you know, still – Of course. Uh, hey, they're college – yeah, On occasion. Yeah, they're college I kids. mean, like, like I had a – I didn't have a lot of mandates as a coach. Um, you know, I, I never told guys that they – could or couldn't go for a par five and two or what have you. But my, my deal was like, I don't have any mandates until we go to the postseason. We get to the postseason. If you haven't figured it out by now and you want to do something stupid, I'm going to make sure you don't do it. So I, I didn't, I really didn't have uh, a too big an issue with, with most of these guys. And yes, they still butchered it. But one of the mandates that I had was you will have the flag stick attended from outside of 30 feet and every now and then I would catch a guy who would be about 40 feet away and I'd be a couple fairways over and I'd notice that he had the flag stick taken out and I would say to him after the round hey how long was that putt you had over there on number 12 oh that was 29 feet coach <laughs> you know so uh I can and, imagine and, yeah I can imagine your team had a lot of 20 29 footers in your uh, in your day. Yeah, probably so. Well, and this is another another really funny story about it was Dudley Hart when he won his first tour event on the last hole had about a 50 footer and he took the flag stick out. Ooh. And he rolled it up there about a foot from the hole and tapped it in and won by a stroke. And when I called him that night I, I said something to him about having the flag stick attended. He said, Coach, I don't like to have the flag stick attended. You know that. And when I had that flag stick taken out on last hole, I know it was a 50 footer, but when I had it taken out on last hole, I'm walking around looking at that putt, thinking to myself, I damn sure better two putt this son of a bitch or coach <laughs> is going to kill me. <laughs> That's great. That's absolutely great. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I, you mentioned, it's fascinating. You mentioned the, uh, what you're doing right now. You're mentioning the, uh, consulting with, uh, with junior golf and, and consulting with, uh, with, uh, finding, uh, you know, with, with consulting with programs is maybe, is there, can you maybe speak to some of the things you see that you really like and maybe some, some of the things that jump out that you're like, okay, that's going to need to get corrected if this program is going to succeed long-term. I mean, it's, sometimes it's pretty obvious. Sometimes it's little bitty things. Um, you know, like I remember going to, to one, one place and they had this, this beautiful building and they had this giant room and, um, they had nice coaches offices and they had this really big closet between the coaches offices. Um, you know, men on one side, women on the other. And 
they had the secretary sitting out in the middle of this big room, like no privacy at all, nothing, just sitting out in this in the middle of this room. And I, I, I looked at the coach and I go like, hey, have you ever considered making that room the secretary's office and finding other storage areas in this building, which is plenty big and, um, you know, and, and making better use of this particular building. You don't have a conference room. Why don't you cut it in half and have a conference room where your teams can meet and so on. Oh my God, I never thought about that. Those are both great ideas. And I mean, it didn't have anything to do with golf, but it had a lot to do uh, with the, the sizzle, like I said, of a recruit comes in there and they go like, oh my God, the secretary is out in the middle of this big old room, which is multi-purpose and they're not even using it for anything. You know I mean? It's just little things like that. It's called, like I said, it's called an audit. So, um, now there, a lot of it has to do with their facilities. Some, sometimes there's, there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes there is, um, and uh, a lot of it has to do with how you run your program. Do you have structured practices or do you just, are, are you just one of these guys that has the qualifiers and basically, you know, lets the kids practice on their own every day and hope they get better. Um, you know, so all kind of different ways to look at how to coach college golf. But, um, you know, I just, I wrote a book. I mean, I have a notebook that's about a hundred pages long and it goes over, you know, everything from player development to recruiting to fundraising to facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they pay me to come in there and talk to them about it and, whether they take my advice or not, I don't know. Cause I, you know, I leave, but uh, you know, and then they're welcome to call me back occasionally. And they do a lot of them do. And, you know, I, I enjoy that. I don't do that that much anymore, to be honest with you, just because I'm not big on getting on an airplane anymore. And not, not just because of COVID. I mean, I'm just kind of tired of traveling. Uh, and, and I have a, I have a version of that where I can send them the notebook and I'll spend a half a day on the phone with them and explain the entire notebook with them. Obviously, that's a lot cheaper. Uh, I don't get a lot of those, uh, but any program could afford it. Um, but I did about 20 of them where I actually visited the, 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 the site of the school. And um, I think most coaches got a lot out of it. I will. Uh, so let me just go ahead and close this out unless there's a is there a story that I have not pivoted towards that that you uh is a go-to that you like to share i don't want to leave anything out if you had something you wanted to th- wanted to throw in there well you ask about the masters and um i guess that my my favorite master story that i just kind of forgot about when we were talking about the masters was um the first round in 87 the u.s amateur champ used to play with the de- defending masters champion which was jack nicholas sure and you just played a twosome and um, we were we we're standing on the tee, getting ready to play. We we're playing like at one thirty. It was hot. It was windy. The scoring was high. Sixty nine was low round of the day. Here I am, uh, getting ready to hit my first shot at the Masters with the greatest player that's ever played, and 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 arguably the greatest golf tournament that that there is. And um, He's getting, you know, they, they call him to the tee and, you know, Jack Nicholas, six time masses. I go like, you know, I'm just going to turn around and I'm not even going to watch him hit. I'm just going <laughs> to, just not going to watch, just turn around. So I turn around and pretend like I'm piddling around with something in my bag or whatever. And as soon as he hits it, it's like, woo, woo, yeah, yeah. And then like total silence. And, uh, they, uh, I don't know where it went, but I know it's not a good shot. And so I get up there and try to get my ball to stay on the tee. And uh, somehow, with the grace of God, I rip it as good as I got down the middle of the fairway. And we're walking down the fairway, and uh, we're just chit-chatting. And the caddies, just the two of us, shoulder to shoulder, and, and the caddies are up there about 15 yards ahead. And... I see this accumulation of people way to the left, almost in the ninth fairway over in the trees over there. And when we <laughs> we're walking along and he says to me, 
He says, you know, buddy, I've been playing here for 27 years, and that's the worst tee shot that I have ever hit <laughs> off of this tee. And I just I looked over at him, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, listen, Jack, I know – I know I can be a little bit intimidating to play with, but I think after three or four holes, you're going to be all right. <laughs> and he laughed and laughed and laughed, and we had a great day. I can honestly say that um, he, he's one of the the greatest playing partners you would ever want to have in that situation. I mean, it almost, it literally almost felt like he went out of his way to try to help me feel comfortable in what was obviously a, uh, an uncomfortable but incredible situation of course and uh he was he was terrific that's a great story to end on um i appreciate you stopping by the back of the range and uh and and get get geared up for that mixed uh for that mixed tournament okay sounds good uh, <laughs> yeah i'll do it i appreciate it enjoyed it and uh anytime happy to do it and there you have it. Special thanks to Buddy Alexander, former Walker Cupper, former U.S. Amateur Champion, and National Championship Coach at the University of Florida. Also thanks to Nick Gillum, one of my former guests, and uh, he played for Coach Alexander, so thanks to Nick for uh, helping put this one together. Don't forget, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Every single episode, even Nick Gillum's, is available at the website, thebackoftherange.com. We'll see you again next time for another episode here at the Back of the Range.